I'm back. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, yes, please join back. And Chris, if you're out there, join back in. It looks like we had some uh, connection issues. But um, I wanted, this is part two of the tool tip series. And um, hey there, Michelle, thanks for coming back. And there we go. All right. Yes. Welcome back. Hi, Karen. Hi, Brent. Brent, your stuff is on the way. If you haven't gotten it already, I'll send it out on Monday morning. So, hi there. Welcome hi. back. <laughs> I got stuff on the way. Um, Brent is uh, out on the East Coast, and I was sending some stuff to him. So, yay, it's on the way. Okay, so back where we were. So, what I wanted to show you guys, though, is the um, with the Lion Punch Forge graver uh, that we've got here. We're going to do a little engraved line. But um, you were saying about, uh, we were talking about practicing when we left off a moment yeah. ago. Um, but yeah, you know, practicing with any tool is going to make you a better craftsperson with it. Um, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to screw things up. That's okay. It's part of the learning process. Um, and sometimes you might find a new way to do something. And hopefully you don't hurt yourself doing it. But um, that happens too sometimes. Um, oh, wow. But yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So anyway, let's, um, let me show you here what we've got. Um, your standard like in, uh, engraving tool, a graver like this, has uh, the piece of steel and then it's sharpened on the end and shaped on the end so that it basically bites and then plows into the metal. And as it does that, um, it uh, makes a little plowed line and pushes the metal up or peels the metal up out of the way. So with the, um, the bead setting, it's, um, you're actually using that furrowed line, the, the pressure from the furrowed line, to hold the stone in place, cleave it in place with the sort of mushed up metal. The, the burr that comes up from that furrowed line is kind of sharp and using a beading tool you can roll that little burr down into a nice little ball and you're actually setting the stone with that furrowed pressure that's been pushed in over the stone and then the ball is just sort of a decorative topping that looks good so and not sharp so basically what you're doing check it out Oh, look at that. It's from Bejeweled. <laughs> so what you're doing in the metal is sinking the stone down. And I will cut a seat for the stone the same way that I would cut a uh, seat for a flush setting. So I want to set it about um, using my stone setting burr. I want to take it down so that the girdle is sitting just slightly below the surface. And I can get some metal up over the girdle. So it just needs to be sitting down in the surface deep enough so that the surface of the metal is just um, above your girdle and just below your table. So you've got enough metal right at that line there that can roll over and hold the stone in place. Um, you don't want the girdle to be at or too deep in the metal. You want it to be just below the surface so that the surface of the metal comes about halfway up that crown pavilion. Then what you're going to do is using your graver, you push, you engrave into this line, you sort of dig down and you create this nice little deep furrow. And as you do that, it, what? It compresses. <laughs> My, uh, 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 there we go, wax. It um, compresses the metal over the girdle of the stone like that, you can kind of see a little bit of that wave compression there. And then you've got that burr right here. And with the little cup tool, the little beading tool, you actually end up rolling that little bead down like so. And this makes a nice little round bead, but it's the compressed metal from that furrowed line that's actually holding the stone in the setting. Um, so it's, uh, it's uh, similar to the flush setting where you're burnishing down the whole rim, but instead of burnishing down the whole rim, you're raising these cleats around the surface. And you can do as many of those as you want. You can do, you know, 10, 20 of them, but you're probably going to need at least three 
to hold the stone securely. Um, I usually will do four and then have some little accent pieces coming in from the sides. So like that, Ta -ta. so just like that. Yeah, Chris, have you done any bead setting? Have you played with that a little bit? Yeah, I've done quite a bit of it. One of the, uh, one of the things I really like to use is those clear templates for drawing lines and mm -hmm. all that. Most of them have a uh, cross in there so that you can kind of see where your, you know, your uh, center is. Yeah. Center is. So what I'll do is I'll place that over. I'll make little marks on where I want my, my beads to be raised at. And then right. if I accent beads later on, I'll rotate that template till it looks right. Uh, Jimmy Duresta, I know he's not a jeweler, but he is a maker, a YouTube maker, and he has a saying that if it looks straight, it's straight. Yeah. Your eye is one of the most amazing measuring tools that that there is. And it's it is so good at seeing um like circles that are out of round or a line that's not straight because we've got because most people uh uh are fortunate enough to have two and so because of that uh perspective if one lines off a little bit or it doesn't appear to be straight your your eyes can see that little bit of fluctuation so it does create this really marvelous way of sort of um uh, being able to judge if something is straight or round or, you know, perfectly square. And it's um, sometimes hard to achieve <laughs> those perfect circles and lines and squares, but your eye is actually a really good judge of, you know, what, what looks right. What, because when it looks right, yeah. Enlightenment, uh, eye lighten, eye alignment. Yes, I, exactly. I, eye alignment. <laughs> I, I had exactly. an experience when I was younger, when my grandfather was alive, he was a, an experimental machinist. And so I was showing him something that I had bought and he's looking it over and he goes, they drilled that hole 10 thousandths off to the left. And I'm right. like, no. And so sure enough, he got out his micrometer and oh 10 thousandths off to the left. Oh my gosh. And it can make a difference. You know, when you're working with something that is, extremely accurate actually just recently um and you would love this especially chris um adam savage who is you know the, the most adam oh shut up <laughs> from uh savage industries and mythbusters for those of you who don't know who adam savage is um but uh adam savage does one day builds and a lot of um uh, making and used to work for industrial light and magic and has worked on all kinds of stuff. He's down in uh, the Bay area and is just absolutely, you know, the most down to earth practical maker. And I really love that about him. I, I come from a mixed media making background as well. And I love to see people that are working with, you know, tools that, that, that function on so many levels that you can use them for, you know, woods, paper, ply, you know, plastics, fibers, and all kinds of things, and and finding ways to make the tools adapt to the use that you need, um, and making new tools. But he just recently did a um, one of his new YouTube videos is um, about measurement and the fact that measurements are never really exact; they're comparative. And the, and I was like, oh, that's true. So uh, looking at measurements and comparative nature is really fascinating and it explains it incredibly well. And I would definitely recommend if you don't follow Adam Savage um, uh, and uh, Savage Industries um, on YouTube or here on Instagram that you take a look because he is full of amazing information is an amazing, you know, creative person and, uh, and is a, and I respect him it, it very highly as a maker. He is just phenomenal. So anyway, let's, let's talk about bead setting here. So I sort of showed you my, my giant version, but when you're doing this with your, whoop, there we go. I'll get this a little bit, uh, so you guys can see it. Usually during the classes, I've got my uh, camera set up so you can see much closer, but with the hand engraver, you're usually, um, you know, graving your line 
And as you come up to the, you're sort of digging in, pushing it forward. And with that metal you're pushing forward at the end of the line, as you get close to the stone, you pull up. And what that does is it moves that metal up over the, the lip of your stone. So with this, um, the same thing, it's the same graver. It has the same shape and it's gonna plow a V into the metal. And it may take you more than one line to be able to do this. You may have to sort of go in. I usually will scratch in a light line with a, a needle to get a real nice straight line to get it started. And then go in with my graver and work in my first line. There we go. And slow and steady will get you a pretty accurate line you can trace over and your graver will follow that line. And if you get to the end, a little pressure, and then tip it up, and that'll raise that burr. And it's nice and sharp right now, but I can see that it has pushed a little wave of metal over the girdle of my stone. So, so I can kind of come in and cock it to one side and come in and cock it to the other side. And again, that'll create a really lovely line as I get to the end, a little more pressure, and I put pull up, and that creates that little burr that comes uh, standing up off the surface. And it is going to be sharp. Um, I will roll around to the opposite side when I do this and do like that tracer line again to get it sort of rolled forward and gives me something to follow. And I'll go down one side, and as I get close to the stone, more pressure and pull up. And I'm digging in to get that line started. And that'll get me nice and deep into the metal. And then just roll up. So now I've got a bead on each side. And I'll continue to do that. But the thing that, that I think most people mistake is that it's the bead that's holding the metal and it's, or the stone in place. And it's not. It's actually the, that wave of metal that is compressing up over the girdle of the stone that's actually holding the stone. The bead is a decorative accessory at this point. So there are little beading tools like this, and you find a uh, little beading tool that's just big enough to fit over your burr. And this one looks good. And you get your little handle. And I'll usually come in and grab the burr and roll up and polish it down. And that compresses the top of that little burr into a ball. So I'll take it and just roll right down. And you don't wanna to put too much pressure on it. Like you don't wanna slide into it and break off the bead. So I'm usually just coming in and catching it on that edge and rolling up to get that on, bead. On your next bead, Jennifer, try putting yeah. the tool in the uh, adapter. Oh, yeah. So using the beading tool to knock down the bead. Yep. I haven't tried that. That is a brilliant thought. You've done this before. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so the engraving tools, uh, the engravers, Chris, you can use uh, the aftermarket uh, One eighth blanks. inch round or two millimeter square. Say that one more time. One eighth inch round or two millimeter square. Okay. So you can use that stock and make your own stamps and gravers and things like that. But Extra yes, awesome. beading tool, here we go. So using that, oh, it kind of just hammers the ball right down. Kind of punches it right in. Oh, that looks good. I like that, Chris. I haven't tried that before, All right. obviously. It does make a nice little finished bead on the top. Yeah. Cool. And as you do that, it will, um, as the burr rolls down, because you're sort of got this burr like this, and as you do the bead over the, t or the little cup over the top, it sort of rounds it down like that. Um, and I think, here we go. Where are you, camera? Oop, right there. Oop. So one of the, one of the, where are you? Kind of visual there it is. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So you get those little beads 
rolled over your stone. And these, this is just a little practice piece. And I really want to encourage you guys to practice. But um, the little beads just kind of roll down. And you can do a whole bunch of them and have a little fun with it. And the, yeah. So anyway. One of the visualizations I make for uh, flush setting mm -hmm. is if you take a ball, the ball part of a ball peen hammer and right. smash it against a piece of copper or whatnot the center of that ball goes down, it decreases in size, and everything else bumps Spreads out. Because hammering and yep. flipping doesn't delete stock, it doesn't delete material, it just moves it. So what you're doing yeah. with this technique is that you're doing this like a little tiny ball peen in there. You're pushing that metal so it compresses against right. it. But not so Well, much. and it's, it's, a, um, it's, it's, depla it's displacing the metal that's there. Yeah. So you are, um, you know, if you've ever seen a, uh, yeah, waves in the water, you know, as somebody's plowing through the water, the water moves up out of the way in waves. And that's what's happening with the metal on, you know, uh, a more, you know, macrocosmic, you know, yeah. situation, more static situation. But it is um, like you know plowing through snow you know the snow plow comes through and it moves the metal uh, off to the side yeah. or it pushes it up and rolls it in front um and that's what you're doing with a, a graver you're you know plowing the the metal like this little furrow out of out of the front and it peels up and cuts it out of the way um and same thing like a burnisher if you take a round burnisher and burnish yeah. a straight line on a piece of metal where you're not actually cutting a like a you know any kind of material you're not cutting it out of the way you're not right. carving it out that burnished material isn't disappearing it's just moving yeah it, and the metal can compress to a certain extent but because the the gravers are sharp cutting tools they're slicing into the metal and peeling it up um but yeah and with the um the uh, bead setting tools it's just you know, compressing it into that little ball where it was like like that right? uh, sharpen and, and and moving the material cutting the material out of the way I drew a picture you did I did so oh yeah so this is essentially your graver and I have right. a little triangle on the end there so it's a square and this is what it looks from a side profile here's your cutting point this is what it looks like from kind of an upward angle looking down at it. Here's your cutting point. Yep. If you're to turn it over and look at the backside, this is your cutting point here. Now, right. if you're bead setting, on a normal engraver, you want to cut a heel where you kind of do a slight grind on the backside of the graver because what that's going to do is allow your graver to cut into the metal and then slide along it cutting and those that heel acts as a bearing surface so you can cut straight lines yeah the and what whatever degree that heel is cut at it keeps you kind of at that that plane so it's like like the flaps on a plane it yeah. keeps you at that same level no. um and allows you to sort of roll along that the opposite is true when it comes to bead setting you don't want to have that bearing surface and cut a straight line. You want that graver to cut down into the metal as deep as you can to lift that burr out. So right. when you're bead setting, it's advantageous that you do not cut a heel on your graver. You do not yeah. want sliding and, and cutting that material. Or if it's just just a absolute minimum, um, yeah. it can allow you to sort of cut in and keep it from like just continuing to sink all the way down. So I'm kind of so, what you're doing here. It's a little different angle, and I'm using my finger as a. I'll try not to cut it. So, yeah, don't I, don't do so, what you did this weekend. <laughs> I'm bead cut out, bead cutting my finger here. So I'm gonna come in. I'm gonna basically dig down deep into that that little uh, area where I want to displace metal, and then once I'm in there, I'm gonna lift my graver up, so that metal pushes up against that, and that gives me that raised burr that I can then bead set. Yeah, right. But like I said, you know, it's that um, it's that displaced metal, not the burr. It's that wave of metal that's um, moving in front of your graver yeah. that creates that like bulge. And then the, the bead comes up here. So you've got this bulge going over 
the girdle of your stone and then the bead coming up on top of it. So it's sort of like, rip, and then this thing like this. Yeah. And yeah. then you're balling that down on top of that. that the bolt. bead acts kind of like a prong. The bead is, is actually more decorative than it is um, functional. Hmm. Um, because the, if the bead breaks off and wears down, you, it's the bulge of the metal underneath the bead that's actually like, like rolled up over the stone. But then so cutting your seat, you want your stone girdle to be slightly lower than the top of the metal. Right. Yeah. Metal that's what I was saying. Plays. You want to have yeah. the, the stone, you should be using a, a stone setting burr that's the same size and shape as your stone. So your stone uh, is going to sit down in the surface of your metal deep enough so it's about halfway up the crown pavilion. So it's going to be like that deep into the surface. Yeah. Um, so it'll kind of sit like that. And then as the graver comes over, it's going to push a little bit of that metal just over the girdle to hold it. Give and it a the warm bead up. is rounded on top. Yeah. Yeah. I love this. Pop cap. Yeah, those are um, not a sponsor. Um, <laughs> Yeah, from Bejeweled, for those people like that it. But love that, Bejeweled. That's yeah, so, but usually with, I mean, if you think about bezels and prongs and flush setting and all those things, you have to have enough metal over the girdle of the stone to be able to set it. And yeah. it's, you know, if you think about it, it makes sense. If you don't have this deep enough and you just have the little bead on there, those beads are very delicate and they they can break off. And so having the, the metal... Um, surface below that bead bulge over the girdle that's i what like you're, what I you're looking for. my flush setting i like to cut my seat so that the table of the stone is kind of flush with the metal it just sits it, it should sit slightly proud yeah. it should just be like yeah it just yeah. barely enough you don't want it so far out that something's going to knock into it and, and right but right so don't want it so deep that you know, you've got to push this mound of stuff over it in order. Yeah, to and it's it is amazing how little how little metal it takes when you're doing flush setting and bead setting to uh, hold the stone in there because the the part of the metal that's holding the stone in place is below the surface because you're compressing it over the girdle of the stone, which is below the surface of the metal. So you've got a um, <clears throat> a little bit of security because that's never going to wear away because it's below the surface yeah. of the, the metal itself. Your stone and, break before that wears away. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, you'll see stone damage before you'll see your prongs and, uh, or your uh, uh, flush setting or your bead setting wear off. I'd be curious to see in a flush setting situation and a stone that was uh, resistant to heat, how mm -hmm. bead setting or flush setting with a welder would work. I don't know. Um, you know, there's um, because setting setting the stone with a bead of, of welding material. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you could do it. I'm sure you could do it, especially if you're using something like your your welder, your laser welder. Yeah, uh, <laughs> just like boop, 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 boop. yeah, that could work. Yeah, yeah four absolutely. points along that. I'm gonna yeah. try it. Well, and there's there are ways. You know, with some stones that are heat resistant, people will do solder setting. Yeah. So they'll actually like set the stones on the surface and then flood it with solder, and the solder will like creep all the way around the, the girdle of the stone and, you know, and hold the stones in place. Um, so it looks like white, it looks like white gold and they usually do it on like a white gold surface. So the solder sort of matches it. Probably but, uh, funner stones to use for experimenting with heat just because they're, they're pretty resistant to it. And, so. Yeah. Like CZs and CZs, garnets. Yeah. That kind of stuff. Uh, garnet, um, not so much. I don't think they're heat, they're less resistant than, so garnets, uh, sapphires, rubies, diamonds, uh, easy. And there's some other ones that are, uh, I wouldn't really try it with anything other than maybe a diamond, a sapphire, and a ruby, or a CZ, just because. And garnets, garnets do pretty well. Do they? Okay. Yeah. I have to give that. Yeah, garnets are pretty tough. Um, and that's, that's the thing. They're a tough stone. And I found that um, you can cast uh, garnets in place and they, they'll get really dark. And as they cool down, they'll go back to red, kind of like enamels yeah. get really dark. Uh, red enamel gets really dark in the oven and then it goes back to red again. Um, and they sort of do that. And sometimes it takes yeah. like a little longer. It's like, oh, it's so dark. <laughs> and then the next day you're like, oh, 
it's red yeah okay uh, um but yeah i think you know any back. yeah any of the stones that are are stable enough to do you know like cast in place or pmc yeah. stuff and you can do that had a fun video where she was removing small diamonds from gold and mm -hmm. diamonds are heat resistant if you melt the gold that has the diamonds in them the melted gold spits the diamonds out yeah yeah and I mean, that's a nice way. You don't want to like quench your diamonds when you're done. Just let them go from, from this cool off naturally. But yeah, heating right. up, heating up uh, gold, making it molten, it'll just spit the diamonds right out. It's kind of fun. To yeah, watch. it's crazy. I've seen, I've seen that. Um, so Chris, thank you very much for joining me for tool yeah. tips tonight. Yeah. And uh, again, you know, if you guys, we are, we do the, hammer hand piece thing and lion punch forge uh, graver adapter pretty regularly with lion little metal boxes here and uh we're one a wonderful partner with you i love partnering with you on on the classes um but we get along so well i know i i have a lot of fun i have a I lot of too. fun the um but the thing that i really like about this especially for people that are um you know either hobbyist or you know new jewelers and wanting to experiment and figure out what they like. This is a really affordable way to do that um, because, you know, the, the, the graver adapter can do all kinds of other stuff besides engraving because you can do textures and all kinds of stuff with it. And again, for me, having a tool that is incredibly versatile helps you do so much more than just one thing. And that's one of the things I really like about that and the hammer hand piece and my flex shaft. So all of these things combined just continue to give me more options and more uh, functionality. Have you to, used one of those to your day job? Say what? Have you taken one of those to your day job yet? Um, you know, I, uh, the, the, the graver? The adapter, yeah. Um, there's not a lot that I would use it for there, um, really. But, because we, right? Because we're not setting, we don't set a lot of stones and we don't do a lot of um, um, engraving or texturing or anything like that. We're usually doing more uh, uh, real simple finishing and stuff. So it's, yeah. But, um, but yeah, I should show Billy for sure. <laughs> um, but yes. So my, my lovely peeps, um, yeah, check it out. Um, and if you are... Um, looking for some more classes. We've got a bunch of fun ones coming up. We're going to be doing, we're talking to somebody this week about doing the fire, uh, torch fire enamels. So I'm very excited about that. Um, Leslie Perino from Chicago. Uh, Michelle uh, is from Lyreworks is going to be doing uh, an upcoming filigree class. And if you don't follow uh, Lyreworks and you are want to be inspired, absolutely go follow Lyreworks because uh, we absolutely brilliant with big hearts lier works lier works lier lier works like french lier 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 hey. oh, oh. <laughs> oh lier works um so so michelle's going to be teaching some filigree coming up um we've got uh you we're going to be teaching uh refurbish refinish reface some hammers coming up soon yeah and like pierre oh there we go like pierre there. <laughs> so yeah, so we'll be doing that and uh, got a bunch of fun classes coming up. Then we're going to be doing, I think, a intro intensive weekend coming up on uh, Memorial Day weekend. So nice. Lots of fun classes coming up. So check it out. Thanks again, Chris. Of course. My pleasure. It's nice being yeah, here. Yeah. I will Hi see everybody. you later on. And um, yeah, have a great we, evening and don't be afraid to play. Go out there. You're going to be in Tucson. Oh, yeah, if you're going to be in Tucson, yes. go check out, uh, uh, go say hi to Chris the at uh, the Casino Pepe Tools del Sol, booth. And it's the True Blue Bead Show. I'll be there vending for Pepe Tools. And then uh, I may also have some of my own stuff there uh, for you to look at after hours. So there you go. Yeah, Let yeah, definitely that. say hi in Tucson. Uh, yeah. You know who else may be there? I haven't, we talked about it today, but there's a good chance that my good friend Nancy Hamilton would come and, and sit at the booth for me for a while. Oh, so, that'll be fun. Um, if, if that comes yeah. through, I'll make sure I post for it. But yeah, you might be able Please to. Please do. Yeah. Nancy post Hamilton. lots of pictures. Oh yeah. <laughs>
Yeah. yeah. All and right. I will ham it up. All right. Okay, you guys. Have a great night. We'll see you next week. If you want to um, watch any of the other tool tips, you can sign on to YouTube and all of our tool tips are there. Um, Chris has got some great YouTube channel stuff as well. So check that out and have a great week. And Chris, have a great time in Tucson. Yeah, absolutely. We'll talk. All right. Bye.